Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you all here on this first Sunday in Lent. And I uh, uh, want to thank you for, for being here. If you're here for the first time, I'd ask you to uh, fill out the attendance re register with your name, address, phone number, and email address. And we'll get in touch with you this week, then pass that along. To, uh, to other folks as well. Those of you who are joining us via the internet, we're delighted to have you with us as well. Uh, we would uh, be even happier if we could see you uh, live and in person. If you can't, we understand. Uh, if, um, uh, if you can, please know that you are always welcome. Uh, that's particularly the case on uh, the first Sunday of the month. Today we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion and in the EPC that sacrament is open uh, to all Christians. So um, please join us uh, if you are such. Please join us uh, when it comes around. Uh, several things to, uh, to bring to your attention. One is the, the uh, choir is back in action. Uh, they're not going to be singing every Sunday, obviously, but, uh, but they're, they're slowly ramping up. And so they're practicing after worship each week in the choir room. And whether you've been part of the choir, the, uh, choir before or not, uh, if you would like to sing with them, I suspect that they could, uh, could probably fit you in somewhere. And so uh, if you're interested, uh, don't hesitate to speak to uh, Kathy Swafford or to any of the current members of the choir about what that involves. Um, uh, for the deacons, please know that your meeting this coming Tuesday is postponed for one week. It'll be on the 15th rather than the 8th uh, because uh, Carol Walker needs to be up in, up in St. Louis. So um, please note that. Um, Women's Association meets on Wednesday at one o'clock in the library, and that's for all of the uh, women of the church and any any ladies you'd like to bring. Uh, that's a good a good way to be introduced to the church. I know there are several just in the last last few months, uh, several uh, ladies who have been uh, introduced to the church in that setting, and that's a good place uh, for them to do so. Um, a couple of other things that I'd like to mention. One is uh, you probably saw the, uh, the announcement about Purim uh, that, was on the, um, that was on the screen uh, earlier. Please note that uh, the, the Purim party festival uh, will be March, Saturday, March 26th, but it will be from 10.30 to 12.30. I think it said 3 o'clock up there, which uh, most of the people in question probably would not be able to be here the next morning because they'd be gibbering in a closet somewhere uh, if they were there, there that long. <laughs> what? Too, too, too much sugar, yeah, for sure. So, uh, so yes, 10, 1030 to 1230, and that's on the 26th. Uh, also want to mention that, um, that, the, uh, that even though we're just starting Lent, uh, we're already looking ahead uh, at least a little bit to, uh, to Easter, and uh, we will be having our Easter egg hunt, which we've not been able to have the last couple of years. We will have that on Saturday, April 16th, and there will be more in the bulletin and the beacon about that as we get closer. I think that should do it, so let's worship the Lord.
Good morning. Please stand with me for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning is from Psalm 119. My soul clings to the dust. My soul melts away for sorrow. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord. For your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just ask today that as we have gathered in this place as your people, that you would make your presence real to us. The Father, that we would experience in song, that we would experience your presence in word, and Father, that we would experience your presence in, in the communion today. God, we ask that even though at times that our hearts do cling to the dust, that our hearts do melt away for sorrow, God, that it is you who brings us peace, that it is you who brings us rest, that it is you who brings us grace. And Father, we just ask today that everything that we do would, be, uh, would glorify you as we worship you today, and we ask that in Christ's name, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 70, Join All the Glorious Names. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew. do when I have prayer of the people, I like to explain one particular prayer so you'll understand why I'm praying in such a way. I'm, I'm going to be praying for 
uh, people in Nigeria, the persecuted church, specifically in Kaduna State on January 30th, the militant Fulani Muslims attacked the village. They killed 11 Christians and they burned down most of the homes in the village. One survivor said these herdsmen burned down the community almost completely. So those are some of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We will be praying for them. Shall we pray? Lord, what a privilege it is to come to you in prayer. We have so many things that we need to be talking to you about and so many things that you want to bring about to glorify your holy name. We pray, Lord, at this time for the situation in Ukraine. We pray, Lord, that you, your ways could prevail, that your peace could have its way, and that you could guide the decision makers to do the right thing, and in many cases, they're not doing the right thing. So have your way, Lord. Work in miraculous ways, Lord. And we do pray uh, specifically for those acquaintances our congregation have in Ukraine that you could Keep them safe, Lord. Lord, we pray for our congregation as we have a mission to make disciples. We pray, Lord, that this could be a reality and not a motto, that we could love you, we could walk with you, we could serve you. And Lord, as we, uh, even today, in corporate worship, as we encounter you, will that, will that grow us? to love you more and to serve you in a better and more profound way. We pray as we experience Christ in our Sunday school classes and journey groups, that that experience when we see Christ, even in the lives of other people, of our brothers and sisters, that we will know you better and we will love them better. And Lord, as we engage the world, we take you to those that we encounter throughout the week. And I pray specifically that you open doors for us that we might have opportunities to share your love with people maybe we don't even know. But open those doors, keep us ever sensitive to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lord, I, uh, I do pray the same for other churches in our community. We would love to see your Holy Spirit just stir the hearts throughout the community. There, there could be an awakening and indeed a revival in the land and a revival here in Union County where people would just sit up and take notice and they'll say, wow, look at what God is doing. And that's what we want, Lord. So bring it on and let it happen. Lord, we pray within our congregation, the needs of uh, those who have spiritual needs, those who have emotional needs, those who have physical needs, you know who they are, Lord, and we lift them up to you that you might minister in your own profound way in many lives and people could know you and experience you in ways that maybe they haven't before or recently. Lord, we lift up um, those believers in Nigeria, we pray, Lord, that you will comfort those who are grieving their losses. You will give them hope in the midst of despair. And Lord, you will even give them the grace to forgive those who attack them. And we pray the love of Christ for those who have been attacked and also for these uh, Fulani Muslims, that you're, you could prevail even into their lives, that they could repent and begin to love you. So Lord, uh, we thank you for teaching us to pray. We thank you for the prayer you taught your disciples to pray, and as your disciples, we pray it together at this time, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are blessed to be able to gather here this morning in peace and in freedom. And we thank God for that, even as we thank him for his son and all his other countless blessings. We uh, have an opportunity to express that gratitude now through the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you are good all the time. Even when we are disobedient, even when we turn from you, uh, even when the world seems like a dark place, you are always good to your people. We give you thanks that you are there even amidst the darkness and that you will and do bring us through it. Father, we bring these gifts to express our gratitude for that and so much more. And we ask now that you would bless these gifts and those who gave them and use both for the extension of your kingdom here in Anna, in, throughout Southern Illinois and to the ends of the earth. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The epistle reading, <clears throat> excuse me, the epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who form, formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. 
There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their obedience, their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Bless this reading of God's word. Please stand as you're able for our next hymn, number 435, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus uh, said to him, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a high a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. The fourth chapter of Hebrews contains one of the most important affirmations in scripture. Hear this from verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's an amazing statement. The writer of Hebrews, who I believe is the Apostle Paul, Paul's uh, uh, affirmation is this, that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, is able to sympathize with our weaknesses and understand our temptations because he is like us in every respect save sin. That means that when the Lord sees us struggle with temptation, get angry, experience rejection or grief or even fear. He knows what we're dealing with. During this season of Lent, as we contemplate the ways that we fall short of the glory of God and seek to repent and to renew our relationship with the Lord, we're going to take a look at some of the ways that the humanity of Jesus makes that relationship uh, one of genuine love, forgiveness, and grace rather than one of abstract justice or mercy. And we'll begin by taking a look at the story of Jesus' own temptation, obviously one known to the writer of Hebrews, one known to all of the early disciples as we find it in Matthew chapter 4. Now, Jesus had uh, started his public ministry, but It was still in its very, very early stages. The previous story in Matthew uh, is the story of Jesus' baptism in which he was initially revealed to the world. He then is led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the one who takes him into the desert to be tempted. Wait a minute, aren't we told elsewhere that God never tempts anyone? No, what we're told is that God does not cause anyone to sin. That's our decision. But the temptations, or as some translations put it, the testing that Jesus experienced in the wilderness very much can come from God. And it is for our Good. In fact, there are several reasons why Jesus was sent out to the desert to experience Satan's temptations. Uh, he was sent out there to, to be strengthened and empowered for the, the three years 
mission that he had ahead of him. Uh, he was being prepared for what was to come. He was there to uh, commune unhindered with his father. And his father would provide uh, the strength and the power that was needed for him, not only to deal with Satan's temptations, but with everything that that three years of ministry was going to bring him. He was there to commune unhindered, and for 40 days and 40 nights, he remained in that wilderness completely alone. I don't know about you, that prospect <laughs> is frightening to me, the idea of being completely alone for, for that long. I once, uh, once went to a, a Trappist monastery in uh, North Carolina, uh, my, my plan was to be there overnight to spend about 24 hours uh, in, in solitary uh, prayer and uh, reading of scripture. I lasted six hours. <laughs> and then I went to the two Trappists uh, and, and told them I thanked them very much for their hospitality, but I needed to get home. I had no way of communicating with anyone, so they had no idea how I knew I needed to get home, but I suspect they did in fact know that I'd realized that what Jesus went through here, <laughs> I couldn't make even a small fraction of, uh, of what he was, was able to, to deal with. But then again, his relationship with his father uh, was, was one that I can only envy. He was there to tame the body. He was there taken away uh, from the comforts of homes such as they might have been. Uh, he was out without shelter. He was there without bed or pillow. Uh, he undoubtedly uh, had to provide uh, uh, water for himself and he fasted for those 40 days and 40 nights. And once again, something I, can, <laughs> I can't really conceive of. He was out there to be tested, to be challenged, in order that he would know, his father already knew, what, what, what the result of this was going to be. This was the human Jesus being shown for a certainty that he was up to coping with the temptations and the threats that the world posed to him and would pose to him over the remaining three years of his life. So there was a very definite purpose in sending him out. And, uh, and that's one that as human beings we can and should be able to relate to because we all find ourselves tested at times. We all find ourselves uh, being challenged to live up to what we say we believe, challenged uh, to live in the way that we know that we should live challenged to walk not just in word but in deed that's not always easy for us it wasn't easy for him 40 days 40 nights and at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights well he was hungry and the tempter which is to say satan came to him with three temptations first temptation of the flesh. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. You got the power. You can conjure up food from nothing or from, you know, just about anything. I look at the, look at the stuff here on the pulpit. I have no idea why some of this stuff is here. Uh, anybody lost a pair of reading glasses? Um, I don't know. There's this, um, you know, any of this. Jesus wanted to make this into, into, into chocolate chip cookies. He could. He had the power to do that. And Satan knew that he had the power to do that. He uses the word if at the beginning of his sentence because in some ways the ultimate temptation that he was laying on Jesus was to doubt that he was in fact who he knew he was. Well, Jesus' response, of course, uh, is you have got to be kidding. Uh, and more specifically, 
This is not something that God would approve of. Why? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. For Jesus, subsisting on the word from the Lord, from, from, from his Father, was good enough. His physical hunger would take care of itself. And, uh, and in fact, it did. So he was tempted uh, by the flesh. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, there is nothing wrong with eating when you're hungry, okay? There's nothing wrong with food. Uh, we discussed this thoroughly in my Sunday school class this morning, and we decided that there is nothing intrinsically sinful about ice cream, okay? Uh, you, right? We, we agreed on that. Okay, so if anyone here uh, ever feels guilty because you eat ice cream, don't. Unless you're doing it because you're a glutton or because uh, you, you, uh, you know it would be bad for you, uh, but you're going to do it anyway because you're in control of your own body. But intrinsically speaking, there's nothing wrong with satiating your hunger and oh the well the devil was just telling him go ahead uh you know you're hungry so go ahead and eat but he was trying to get him to do that by abusing his power and using it for his good rather than for others for god or for the sake of his mission and so he refused well uh the second uh the second temptation, uh, the temptation of, of, uh, of uh, relationships uh, in their distorted and, uh, and sin-plagued uh, forms. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've got these backwards. That's the third one. The second one is the temptation of faithlessness temptation to put God to the test, the temptation to, uh, to uh, say to God, you know, I want to find out if you will really do what you said you would do. Uh, Satan says, well, he said he'd command his angels concerning you. He, he also said that, 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 that those angels would, would bear you up. Uh, they won't let you strike your, your, uh, your foot against a stone. So uh, if you really believe God, then, then go ahead and, and, uh, and see if he'll do that. Temptation of, uh, of faithfulness. Essentially what he was doing was saying to Jesus, do you really believe God's promises? In much the same way that the serpent, uh, Satan in reptilian form, asked Eve, did God really say that, I mean, she, you know, Eve knew that God had really said what he said. She'd heard him with her own ears. And yet he asked, did God really say that? Did he really mean that? When God promised to save those who, who put their faith and trust in his son, did he really mean that? When God said that he would, he would save you uh, and keep you from harm, did he really mean that? Uh, and Jesus' response, again, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is the essence of faith and faithfulness to hear God's promises and to know that they will be kept. And so he does. Well, uh, the first two didn't work. So, uh, so he takes him up to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And, and Jesus said, is that all you got? Uh, he might have, but he didn't. Uh, Satan said, uh, if, if you will just, if you will just, worship me, if you will just worship me, um, I'll give you power. I'll give you all of the kingdoms 
of the world. And you can do anything you want with them. Hmm. Well, that might have been a tempting offer. I, he could have said to himself, you know, I could do a lot of good with that kind of power. I could do a lot of good for people if I was just in charge. We have politicians who say that very same thing to themselves every single day. I could do a lot of good with this power. Some of them actually mean it. And they really do try to do that. Some of them don't. What Satan was doing was putting Jesus in the position where he'd have to decide not only whether he was going to take these kingdoms, but what he was going to do with them. And the implication of what Satan was saying was, once you've worshipped me, you're mine. And if you're mine, you'll rule the world the way that I want to. Now, under those circumstances, what was more likely that having been given power over the world, Jesus would have ruled say, more like Abraham Lincoln, or more like Joe Stalin? Well, we all know what the answer to that is, if Satan had been the power behind the throne. And of course, Jesus' response is to ignore the offer of the kingdoms, because that wasn't even something Satan could genuinely give him. And instead, he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only shall you serve. Those temptations are ours as well. We're never given the opportunity to rule the world. Goodness knows if we were given the opportunity to rule the world and I were given that opportunity, I could do a much better job. Right? No? <laughs> yes, but, but then I would have minions who would pick up my socks for me and do everything else I needed them to do because I could tell them what to do. But you know, we're not given that opportunity. Instead, we're given the opportunity to exercise power as teachers over children, as advisors over clients, as businessmen over employees, as fifth graders over second graders. Uh, there are forms of power we can't even think of right off the top of our heads that tempt us, tempt, them, tempt us to use them in ways that, uh, that uh, not only don't glorify God, but in fact do nothing but oppress others. Jesus knew what to do, and so he said no to each of those. Now, he also, in the process, demonstrated for us the way to meet temptations, and that is by reliance upon God and upon his word. Keep in mind, Jesus was genuinely tempted here, okay? Jesus was a human being. Yes, he was also God incarnate. But he was nevertheless genuinely tempted because temptation does not mean sinning. Temptation does not even mean wanting to sin. Temptation means having the opportunity to sin. And here's a word of warning that I shared with my Sunday school class this morning. We are surrounded by, immersed in opportunities to sin. Everywhere we go, everything we do, potentially can be turned to sin. Uh, things that are good can be turned to sin. Um, the example I used this morning was 
what if I followed the example of uh, some pastors, I don't think it's very many, but, but I know of a few, uh, who bring a gun with them to worship, to church. They bring a gun with them for the purpose of defending, if need be, if the, if the necessity arises, uh, defending their congregation against those who would hurt them. And that's a good thing, okay? You can argue whether a pastor really needs to do that. And in case you're wondering, no, I never have. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the motivation is good. And presumably, if something terrible were to ever happen, uh, the actions could be, could be laudable as well, defending innocent people. Here's the opportunity for sin. I have that with me in the pulpit. And I look out on my congregation and I realize, you know, there are some people here that this congregation would be really better off if they weren't here. And so that gun that was meant to defend the innocent can, in a moment of giving into temptation, the opportunity for sin, become an occasion for murder. Has that ever happened? Yes, it has. That's not the kind of thing you, you, you hear about every, every week. It doesn't happen every week. Pastors don't do that on a regular basis. But I've heard of at least two inst inst instances within the last 15 years of pastors who brought weapons to church and then turned them on their congregations, okay? Not necessarily in this setting. You know, it might have been a you know, one on one confrontation in a hallway or something, but, but the point is that's what I mean by opportunity for sin. That's what temptation is. If he wanted to, John Haas is confronted with an opportunity for sin every time he looks at Barbara If he wants to, I know John well enough to know that the idea of strangling his wife has never occurred to him. <laughs> that was not meant to be funny. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I need to pick my targets better. Um, Let's assume that thought has never occurred <laughs> to John. But the fact is that simply being there, sitting next to her, he has that opportunity if he, if he wanted to. That's a temptation. Is it a temptation he probably ever even recognized that he had? No. But nevertheless, it's real. That's what Jesus is being confronted with here. Was Jesus going, did, 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 even for a, for a fraction of a second, did it occur to Jesus to think, you know, I really am hungry. I need something. You know, Snickers, anything. No. Does that mean the temptation wasn't real? No. The temptation was real because it was in front of him. It's important for us to recognize that just as the opportunity to sin was in front of him at every moment of his life, it's in front of us as well. And that's why he knows what we deal with. That's why he can identify with us in, in the, the, the problems that we have, the, the difficulties that we face, the times that we blow it. And we, and we give in. Well, he demonstrates for us ways of dealing with that, deal with that with scripture. Uh, this is one reason why memorization is, is important, not as a, a legalistic, oh, I've memorized 43 verses this week. Mm, certainly not as an accomplishment, but rather as a tool to be used when we recognize that temptation is in front of us and we need 
to combat it. We need to turn from it. Uh, not only scripture, but the 40 days of prayer ahead of time were also part of that, pre of that uh, preparation because he knew that he could call on God's power to deal with it when it came to him. And uh, simply trusting God and his promises uh, was part of that as well, relying, relying on his father to give him everything that he needed in order to deal with that. We are in the same position. The fact that Jesus faced temptation has implications for us. I already talked about that. But the fact that he not only faced temptation, but triumphed over it, turned from it, also has temptation. Uh, I'm sorry, also has implications for us. Uh, one is that it, it demonstrates the temptation itself is not sin. The fact that John has the opportunity to strangle Barbara not only doesn't mean that he's not going to necessarily take it, but it means the fact that she's sitting next to him doesn't mean that any sin has been committed. It simply means that the opportunity is there and it's one that he turns from continually, even unconsciously. Okay. Um, the same way that he did with Sean throughout his childhood. Which is why Sean is here today uh, among us, and we're, we're glad that he is. But the fact that he fa Jesus faced temptation and triumphed over it shows that it's not sin because Hebrews says he was, he was sinless. He faced real temptation, and yet he was sinless. So it is possible to face it, to turn from it, and in the process, not to fall into sin. Uh, and that's the second thing. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus doing this in his humanity demonstrated that it's possible for us to do so as well. Now, we contend with something that he doesn't. Okay. We have the old man, as Paul puts it in, uh, in Romans. Uh, we have the old woman, uh, the, the person we were before we became Christians. We still have that person, that zombie, as I sometimes call him, to deal with. And he continues to plague us. He continues to say, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to strangle the old ball and chain. <laughs> uh, he continues to be there and he's going to be there every day of my life <laughs> okay uh, but, um, but that doesn't mean that I have to listen to him I do have the power given to me by God to turn from him when he puts those opportunities in front of me. Uh, and that's the way that Jesus showed us, the way of reliance upon God's word and upon God's spirit and upon God's people because accountability to one another can also make a difference uh, in that as well. It's not that Jesus went to his apostles or his disciples and said, you all need to help me I'm dealing with temptation all the time, just like you are, and you need to, you need to keep me accountable for, for where my eyes are and where my heart is. Uh, he didn't necessarily do that, but that's what part of being part of one body is about, being able to do that with brothers and sisters. One final way that, uh, that makes a difference is right there, the sacrament of communion in which we confront and are confronted by uh, Jesus himself coming to us at his table, inviting us to that table, uh, eating with us, drinking with us, and saying to us, I know where you've been and I know where you are. I know what you're dealing with. I know how hard life can be because it was for me too. But together, together, we can get through that. 
and victory will be yours in the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you allowed your son in his humanity to experience uh, all of the the temptations of, of this world and of life in this world that we do. And in showing us how to deal with them, has shown us the way to triumph over them. We thank you for the victory that you give us in him. And as we come to his, prepare to come to his table to, uh, to receive uh, that strengthening, we ask that you would be in it and in us, not just today, not just during the sacrament, but every day of our lives, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to time of preparation to receive the sacrament first. May we join together in affirming the faith that we hold as one by using the Apostles' Creed found in the bulletin as well as on the screen above me. Please stand as we do so. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born, um, con conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for the correction, sir. May we join together now in a brief period of silent prayer of confession. We have this word of assurance that we are a forgiven people from the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We come to this table as a forgiven people. May God be glorified in that. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly 
sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. Let's pray. With joy, we praise you, gracious Father, for you created heaven and earth. You made us in your image, and you kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. In response to our disobedience and faithlessness, you kept faith with us and sent into the world Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way, and though tempted, was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death, and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. And you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, you sent the Holy Spirit, your first gift for all who believe, to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. We thus ask that you send your spirit upon us, that in sharing the bread we may share in the body of Christ, that in sharing the cup we may share in his blood. Grant that being joined together in Christ Jesus, we may become united in faith and in all things, become mature in the one who is our head, for it is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you.
brothers and sisters, the body of Christ given for us. After the supper was over, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink all of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Christ shed for us. Let us pray. We bless you, Father, for gifts of bread and cup, for sustaining us in hope, for giving us the power to resist temptation and remain faithful to you every day of our lives. We pray for your strength to prepare us now for your service as we offer to you lives of witness and worship in the world that you've made. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in our closing hymn, number 340, I Need Thee Every Hour.
Now, as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has brought us into his kingdom and given us the power to live as his children, go with us and be seen at work in us and through us, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.